Good day, folks. Here we are together again. I must make a confession. It is, I don't have my watch on me, but it's probably around 11.30 p.m. on a Saturday, or on a Friday, that um, I decided to do this uh, video and present to you this week's message. So if I'm a little tired or seem a little tired to you, well, that's the reason. We want to continue today and, uh, oh, by the way, thank you. See, I'm already forgetting things. Thank you for being here with me or inviting me into your places. Uh, may you be blessed by today's message. Today we continue with our sermon series in First Peter, uh, A Living Hope. And in my preparation this week, I came across a blog that was posted back in September of 2023 by Yahoo Finance. And the caption across this blog was, When Tell Death Do Us Part Dies. And this blog presented uh, some stats from Barna Group Research around Christian divorce in the United States. So uh, don't plug your ears if you're from Canada, because I don't think we're too far behind uh, these kinds of stats, even in Canada. Barna Group for 2023 in the States revealed that 36% of evangelicals there go through divorce. This is compared to 33% for mainline Protestants, 28% for Roman Catholics, and 27% for those who identify as non-religious. And the question that was asked in this uh, presentation was, why are Christians getting divorced? And the blog went on to share some of those factors, which I want to share with you a few of them as well. One, according to Barna, many Christians today have adopted the world's relaxed views of marriage. American Christians are more tolerant, if you will, of divorce than earlier generations of Christians. And according to Barna, 79% would go as far as to say that getting a divorce should be easier. Two, the church overall has accommodated Hollywood's impractical and very unrealistic ideals of romance and happily ever after. And when we think about this, when reality hits someone between the eyes, when these kinds of unrealistic expectations go unmet, couples will divorce. Three, Barna discovered that there is inadequate premarital preparation. And as a pastor, I would agree with that statement. Now, many Christians go to pastors like me for premarital counseling, but according to Barna, many pastors, they don't name them or give you a sample or anything, but many pastors rarely give sufficient time to address the key uh, um, success indicators or factors in marriage. For example, things like family backgrounds and conflict resolution and communication between couples and finances. That's a big one. Uh, I'll be honest with you and transparent. I, I do share in these indicators uh, because I think they're important. But according to Barna, many pastors don't have the time, nor do they do this. And four, there is an unequal focus on wedding ceremonies uh, versus marriage enrichment opportunities. And for churches, provide very little support for the daily realities of married life after the big day. These are four things that Barna Group revealed in this particular blog. You know, someone once said this about marriage. The, mar the secret of a happy marriage remains a secret. Someone else said, and I'm sure they said this with the smirks, about marriage, and said a good marriage would be between a blind wife and a deaf husband. Well, all kidding aside, please turn in your Bibles to First Peter chapter two, uh, and we're going to bring it, begin there at verse thirteen and read through to chapter three, verse seven. So, chapter two, verse thirteen, through to chapter three, verse seven. Please join me. Chapter two, verse thirteen. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institutions, institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil 
and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But, when, but if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was the seat found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile uh, in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now we're moving to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they, be, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Verse 5, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Verse 6, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. And verse 7, last but not least, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the, woman, to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Well, the Lord bless the reading to his, of his word. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this time to be together. And uh, we thank you for this time to uh, open up the scriptures here in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3 and chapter 3. And we just uh, are so grateful for this opportunity to be together in this way. Oh, Holy Spirit, the living God, would you just uh, teach us and inform us and lead us in this time together. For the glory of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, uh, my friends, uh, our focus will be here at chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. You know, and as good Bible students, we will address Peter's comments here in the context that they were expressed. First, we want to look at the context of Peter's letter. And we find there, as we've already discussed over the last number of weeks, we discover a major theme throughout this letter. And that theme is suffering for one's faith, suffering for one's trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We also know that Peter, in, these, in this letter, reminds his readers of their status before God. For example, let's go to chapter 1, verse 3 and 5. We read together there, chapter 1, verse 3 and 5. Blessed be the God, 3, 2, 5, pardon me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now we want to flip over to chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, where Peter said, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here, Peter reminding his readers, those first century believers, of their status before God. So as a holy nation, believers are offering up spiritual sacrifice 
which are made manifest by their conduct. And this is their conduct and their good works amongst themselves, amongst the Christians, amongst the church, amongst the neighborhoods that they live in, amongst the workspaces that they occupy, and the wider culture, and those in authority over them. Do you remember what Peter said about that in chapter 1, verse 14 and 16? Peter said, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And then we can also go to chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. You can flip over there in your Bibles. Chapter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Here we have those good works, those good conduct that we have amongst ourselves and in the world around us. So secondly, if we are going to discuss verses 1 to 7 here in chapter 3, we need to include Peter's exhortations, his teaching, his guidance, if you will, concerning domestic relationships. Specifically, what we read together at the beginning, chapter 2, verse 13 to 25, which I will not repeat. Please write that down if you can, and remember it and read it for yourself later. And finally, but just as important, we will need to locate the text in its historical context. So let's read together again verse 1. Verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Please notice how the Apostle Peter started here. He said, likewise, wives. Likewise, wives. Now, the NIV, if you have an NIV translation, and Bill Mounts, who is a Greek scholar, uh, teaches Greek, and I remember having some of his textbooks years ago, translates this Greek verb in this way. And it's going to sound a little weird when I say it, because I... Anyways, I'll just tell you. In the same way. So here's the point. This phrase here in verse 1 points the reader back to the immediate verses that preceded chapter 3, verse 1. Specifically, again, chapter 2, verse 13 and 25 which we have already read. So, friends, therefore, as believers submitted themselves to every human institution, that's verse 13, chapter 2, and as believers, servants, slaves, or free, according to Peter, submitted themselves to masters with all respect, chapter 2, verse 18, in the same way, wives are to be subject to your own husbands, here in chapter 1, verse 3. Now, we do need to spend just a brief moment or two locating Peter's text in its first century context. I want to give all credit here to Craig Keener in his, uh, Keener, not Keener, Keener in his contrib contribution in the IVP New Testament background commentary. So folks, in that Greco-Roman world of the first century, wives were expected to obey their husbands which included faithfulness and adherence to their husband's religion, whatever that may be. And we also need to realize that Peter's context was very religious. Very religious. So among the Roman Empire's worship of the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods, we would also want to include, of course, Judaism, where Christianity came from, and the mystery religions that were abounding in that place, which we can just define simply as cults. And as Christianity spread, we, we find that throughout the Roman Empire, it did so faster among the wives of, say, Judaism and these mystery religions, these cults. For example, and, and the reason behind that is simply is that husbands had more to lose in that first century context socially from conversion to Christianity, because Christianity really became a detested minority religion. And in addition, any religion other than a Roman religion that refused to uh, participate in Roman religious practices, as in the first century, 
uh, they could be uh, charged with atheism. So from this kind of historical context, we find the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, was writing to encourage believers facing a variety of trials for their faith in Christ. And the Apostle here in verse 1 to 6 of chapter 3, addressing believing wise, provided a Christian, if you will, redemptive context for marriage that was, as Keener put it in his commentary, a bold contrast to the first century context. It's interesting to note, my friends, that the Apostle Peter had provided a redemptive context as well for all believers who, obedience, who, in, who in obedience to God, pardon me, were subject to every human institution, as we read already today. And that itself was a bold contrast in that context. It was a countercultural contrast that is even relevant in our time today. So let's go back to verse 1, and let's read... Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. Now, if you remember, and I hope you've been tracking with us, we have dealt with this verb that is translated by the ESV, which I am using, be subject, a few times, more than a few times. But I think because of our 21st century conventions and presuppositions around the role of women in marriage, it's best to do a slight review. If you have a new King James Version, and if you don't, you need to know that uh, it translates this verb, be submissive. The NIV puts it, submit yourselves. Both of those are good translations along with ESV. But what's important to note is the sense in which this word is used in this context. This is a voluntary submission. Wives willingly submitting to their husbands. Let's go back to the text. Notice what Peter said following that first few words. He says, So that even if some do not obey the word, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So we have to ask, who are these some that Peter was referring to? Well, the answer is, your own husbands. And then we have to ask, what was going on with some of their own husbands? Peter answers that for us as well when he says, So that even if some do not obey the word. Now that brings another question. Always lots of questions when we study the Bible. What word? Remember, the Apostle Peter was writing to believers, strewn throughout five regions of present-day Turkey. In this case, he was addressing here in this text married women believers. And according to this text, some of the married women had husbands who did not obey the word. Again, we ask, what word? Well, simply the word of the Lord, that is Jesus Christ and his gospel. You know, a few moments ago, if you remember, I hope you do, we, we briefly discussed the historical context of this particular text. Here we find the Apostle Peter was addressing a specific reality of that context. As you remember, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire. Married women were often being converted faster than their husbands due to the social restrictions that would have imposed on husbands. This would have been husbands who were devout Jews. These would have been husbands who followed in here to other religions, like the mystery religions, those cults, even Roman religion, those who worshipped idols. And we've also learned that wives were expected to adhere to their husband's religion. So these first century Christian wives would no doubt have been looked down upon for their faith in Christ, maybe even mistreated or even possibly charged with atheism for their belief in Jesus and the one God. So the Apostle Peter encouraged the believing wise faced with their various trials. He said to them, be subject to your own husbands so that even as some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. That's verse 1 and 2. You know, recently I was speaking to someone about this very text. Just recently. This person mentioned in the biblical, mentioned that the biblical uh, teaching of being subject or submissive to their husbands was, at the very least for them, difficult to understand. You know, we talked about pain and pleasure culture last week. 
This whole idea of submitting then to another person is seen as, at the very least, I believe, as a hindrance. Something that hinders those things that bring pleasure to a person in our culture today would be looked down upon. At its worst, submission would deny our right to be right, would it not? Now, I came across an article written by Kathy Cordell, who was writing for todayschristianwoman.com, who is married to an unbelieving husband. And Kathy said this that I want to share with you. Quote, I am a strong-willed, independent, confident woman. woman. A, few years, a few years ago, the mere idea of submission made the hair rise on the back of my neck. Yet, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, specifically addresses women married to unbelieving men, urging us to witness with our lives, not with our words. We can see true submission as an opportunity to quietly live the gospel. And Kathy goes on to say, submission is a voluntary response to relinquish one's right for God's greater glory. It is hard to lay down my right to be right, but in the light of God's glory, releasing my pride has lifted both of us, speaking of her husband, to a place of confidence in our marriage. Now, some might be saying or thinking, okay, pastor, I get what the apostle Peter is teaching here. But there's this person I met who is a believer. Wouldn't it be better if I divorced uh, <clears throat> my unbelieving spouse and married the believer? Doesn't the Bible teach that we uh, shouldn't be unequally yoked or, or something like that? And I think this is God's will for me. Well, let me give you the short answer. Emphatically, no and no. That would be, according to the commands of God, idolatry. Idolatry. Let's keep this simply biblical. Let's turn to the Apostle Paul's letter to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13 to 16. There, Paul, writing to that Corinthian church, who, by the way, had troubles of its own, you can check that out for yourself, said this, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, that's what Peter's talking about, now we hear Paul talking about this, and he consents, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13 to 16. I would, I would uh, uh, exhort you or implore you to check that out for yourself. Now you might be saying, oh, pal, okay, pastor, I get it. What if I don't love my spouse anymore? What if I don't love my spouse anymore? I think I love this other believer. Again, let me give you a short answer. No, that would be adultery. Well, okay, pastor, you might be saying, I guess marriage isn't that easy. You know what? You're right. Marriage is not that easy. You see, if your spouse hasn't abandoned you, which includes uh, continuing unrepentant spousal abuse or child abuse. If your spouse is in an adulterous situation or your unbelieving spouse no longer consents, consents to living with you, divorcing your spouse for any other frivolous reason is out of the question. The Word of God does not allow for divorce. You know, on a side note, and I think this is important that we talk about this for a few minutes, before we look at verse 3 to 7 together, Peter's message to wives and husbands is not a comprehensive teaching on God's design for marriage. This is not where you're going to find the Bible, New Testament writers talking about the, comp the, the God's design for marriage. And I think it would be beneficial for you and me, for us, to understand Peter's concern in the marriage with a few bits of the Apostle Paul's commentary on God's design for marriage. Now, similar to Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesian church, includes instructions to the family, 
that is, wives and husbands and children. The Apostle Paul, like Peter, begins his exhortations to wives in the same way Peter, Paul said, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That's Ephesians 5, chapter 22. Uh, Ephesians 5, verse 22. See, I'm getting tired. Apostle Peter there addressing a, believer, a believing wife and husband in that text. And then the Apostle Paul goes about laying out God's design for marriage and the family. Now, time not being our friend, suffice it, uh, first of all, to recommend to you that you read and study this for yourself. Maybe one day we'll do a, a short two or three uh, videos or sermons on God's design for marriage. But in the meantime, you can go to Ephesians, take a pen, write this down. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 32. Go to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 to 16. Then flip over to chapter 9, verse 19 to 23. And then if you're wondering about the role of women in church, you go to Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 14. Flip over to chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 13. But I, I did promise to give you something, so I'll give you two key points from the Apostle Paul's teaching on the design of marriage, God's design of marriage. One, marriage was designed by God for our good, for our flourishing. God gives us boundaries not to hold us back, but to help us flourish. The Apostle Paul said in that Ephesian letter, chapter 5, he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. There Paul, quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Now there, if you went there, you would see God upon completing his work in creation by providing for Adam a helpmate Eve, we find God had a designed marriage between one man and one woman. Not a very popular thing to say, no doubt, in our culture today, but that's God's design for our own benefit, for our own flourishing. We don't have time to go into what happens if we step outside of that. Secondly, Second point I want to share, marriage as God designed it, the Apostle Paul said, is profound. It is profound. Chapter 5, verse 32. So we can ask, how so? Well, Paul went on to say, I'm saying that the marriage, no, that's not what he said. This is what he said. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Again, Ephesians 5, verse 32. You see, the Apostle Paul in chapter 5 of this letter to Ephesus described how wives should submit to their wives as to that their wives should submit to their husbands as to Christ. I am tired. And husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. And here's the point, my friends. All believers, regardless of the race, in other words, the color of their skin, or gender, are equal heirs of God through their faith in Christ. Back to Peter's letter. Verse 3 to 6. Notice here when you read those verses. Let's read those verses together. Verse 3 to 6. Chapter 3, verse 3 to 6. Let's read those. Let's don't guess. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. Let's re read verse six, 5 and 6. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. If you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Verse 3 to 6. Notice what the apostle was not barring women from. He was not barring, barring them or forbidding them from the braiding of hair or putting on gold jewelry or clothing that you wear. Some churches teach those kinds of things. That's just pure, pure legalism. What the Apostle Peter commanded Christian wives to do here was stop from seeking their identity in these external kinds of things. You know, it's the same way today, don't you think? 
First century women faced cultural pressure around fashion and beauty. And even as today, many women would have felt the pressure to live up to this standard of beauty in their culture. And as today, this would include the sense that a wife needs to compete for their husband's affection, for their husband's attention. You know, as we think about the ancient Near East, this first century context in that ancient Near East, we know that there were influential Greek and Roman scholars and philosophers that had instructed women to be modest and dignified. You see, they had actually recognized a woman's true worth as not in her appearance, not on the outside appearance. And it's, this way, and it's in this way that Peter's teaching comes closer to this idea. When he said, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Verse 4. My friends, this is the kind of beauty that won't fade over time. And it's a beauty, according to Peter, that in God's sight is very precious. Verse 4. This is not anything that's holding a woman back. This is actually revealing who she really is in God's sight. A very precious and important person. Well, next we have verse 5. We remember what Peter had already said about believers. In the letter, he was writing to men and women who had placed their hope and trust in God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here at verse 5, Peter asked believing wives whose hope was in God to follow the example of other holy women. Women who also hoped in God and who submitted to their own husbands. Important to note that what Peter is not saying here, Peter was not commanding wives to obey and submit to all men. And the New Testament does not teach this anywhere in the New Testament. And importantly, we need to recognize the difference between submission and obedience. A Christian wife should and must disobey her husband's sinful instructions, but do it in a submissive way. Of course, this should go without saying, but it does need to be said. Peter would not have expected unbelieving women to live in this way. And you and I should not expect unbelievers to live in a godly way. The text before us today describes the lifestyle of women who have placed their hope in God through Christ and Christ alone. Well, friends, we've arrived at verse 7. I hope you're still with me. Let's read verse 7 together. Verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. Now Peter turns to husbands. He said, Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Not be hindered. The Apostle Peter here instructed husbands to how to live with their wives. Now he's obviously talking to believing husbands. At the very center of verse 7, we discover, as one commentator put it, quote, that men should honor and respect their wives. That's at the very center of this verse. Honor and respecting your wife. We have already established that women of the first century, if you remember we talked about earlier, would have been discounted and treated badly by their husbands, possibly. And Christianity's emphasis on submission to God first ahead of the husband was unique and definitely countercultural in the ancient Near East in that first century setting. But when we think about the teaching that men should honor their wives and treat them as equal and co-heirs of the grace of God, as the text is telling us here, through faith in Jesus Christ, well, that would have been radically different. Radically countercultural, I mean. Radically. So what did the Apostle Peter mean here? Well, friends, that a husband who did not honor their wives would find their prayers hindered. For example, verse 7. Husbands who treated their wives abusively or disrespectfully would need to repent and to change their behavior before their prayers and their relationship with God could be restored. Husbands were to show honor to their wives. Husbands were called to protect their wives. 
and husbands were to live with their wives in an understanding way. Understanding that their responsibility was to honor their wives, to learn and grow with their wives as heirs with them of the grace of life which is in Christ Jesus. Well, friends, that kind of brings us to the end. There's a lot more things we can say again. This is not a a sermon or a message on on the design of God's uh, uh, design of marriage that God has put into play. So I just want to close with a quote from 19th century literary scholar and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, who said this, quote, God has landed on this enemy-occupied world in human form. The perfect surrender and humiliation was undergone by Christ. Perfect because he was God. Surrender and humiliation, humili, humili, I'm tired. Surrender because he was man. Now is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us a chance. It won't last forever. We must take it or leave it. I pray to the Lord that you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't and you are not ready for this, I want you to consider it, please, because it is a matter of seriousness that you should consider. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me awake, I suppose, and giving me the strength to say the things that I did. I pray for my friends and my brothers and sisters, the wives and husbands that are listening to this. I pray, God, that they would take the time to learn and understand God's design for marriage. And Lord, we are to submit to you and to every authority that's under us. And the only time we don't is if they make us or, dis- or tell us to disobey your word, to your commandments, your way. No, it's your way, Lord, that we ask for. And Lord, may you be glorified in our lives, in the ways we think, the ways that we speak, and the ways that we do things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.